Hi, Claire and James here. Just before we get stuck into this week's episode, we wanted to let you know the exciting news that the Midlife Reset Audit is now live. This is a first of its kind personalized diagnostic tool designed for midlifers by midlifers. In just three minutes, the audit will help you pinpoint what's really holding you back from living your healthiest, happiest midlife. And most importantly, provide tailored strategies on how to take back control. Midlife doesn't have to be a time of uncertainty. It can be an era of growth, discovery and well-being. So to go ahead and take the audit, go to themidlifementors.com forward slash audit. In this episode, we talk to nutritionist and hormone expert Nikki Williams about the feisty four hormones that are crucial for women at midlife as they navigate perimenopause and menopause. Nikki talks us through her own journey where her own symptoms and research inspired her to leave the corporate world, study nutrition and hormones so that she could help empower other women. We talk about HRT, the importance of estrogen, cortisol, thyroid and insulin and the relationship between them getting effective hormone tests and the lifestyle adjustments we can make to support our hormone health we hope you find this as interesting as we did hi i'm james davis and i'm claire davis we're the midlife mentors here to lift the lid on how to achieve health and happiness the balanced no-nonsense way Hello and welcome to another episode of the Midlife Mentors with me, James. And me, Claire. Hello, how are you doing? It's another lovely sunny day here in London. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll soon be winter. <laughs> someone put on my um, alcohol-free group that I'm part of. Um, someone lives in Mexico and has come back, she's English, and has come back to the UK to visit family. She said it feels like autumn. And someone put underneath, it's been autumn since last autumn. <laughs> I thought that kind of explains things quite well, to be honest. Oh. But anyway, moving on from the weather. Moving on. Like... Uh, today we're going to be talking all about hormones. We've got like a, an amazing hormone expert to talk us through that. But just before we get into that, what have we been up to, Claire? Well, you have run your workshop, mm. which was awesome. You did that solo. Driving in midlife. Yeah, yeah, you did that solo. So I was very proud that you did that and you had a great response. Lots of people turned up. And if you would like the replay of that, then um, I just pop an email, actually. Just pop us an email, team at themidlifementors.com. Pop us an email and we'll send you the replay of the workshop. Yeah. And other than that, we took some time out. We went away we to did. a off-grid shepherd's hut oh, in the Suffolk countryside. We won't reveal the location because actually, selfishly, we want to, we want to keep it ourselves. But it's a, a shepherd's hut <laughs> with a little outdoor kitchen and a very small lake that you could jump in. Lots of weed and ducks. But yeah, it was, it, was nice. it was a bit restricted. As soon as I jumped in and the weed kind of started strangling me, I thought, mm, maybe, maybe I'll get out now. Well, what I thought was really interesting for me, it was obviously lovely to, to disconnect and switch off. But I think if we talk about this all the time, that kind of overwhelm of technology, and I think when we're in it and the phone's just going, you, you get used to it. But, you know, I had it off and it was less than 48 hours. When I turned it back on, I had 60 plus WhatsApp notifications and 400 plus emails. That's just from 48 hours. I'm just, just like wow, no wonder our attention spans are shot and we feel so overwhelmed and get anxious around all this stuff as well. That's before I even looked at social media. I, I want to go off. On there. I want to go off grid now. Like I, I do. I want to go completely off grid. We had, um, we could poo with a view, which was amazing. <laughs> which I loved. Shower with a view. There was just nothing around. It was just heavenly. And it just made me think, mm, London, central London or that. Uh, I, don't, I do think it helped that we did actually have Three days of sunshine, which that, was that rare, yes. really rare. Very good so, time. yeah, that's what we've been up to. Mm. Anyway, let's introduce our lovely guest, Nikki Williams, to the show today. Um, we'll quickly introduce her, and then obviously we'll pass over to Nikki so she can tell us a little bit more about herself. So, Nikki's an award-winning nutritionist, author, speaker, and a leading expert in women's health and hormones. And she's the founder of Happy Hormones for Life, which helps women of all ages rebalance their hormones, reclaim their health, and feel better than Woo, ever. Really exciting, Nikki. Welcome. Hello. Hey guys, how are you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited about today's chat. Well, great to have you here because I think whenever we do podcasts around hormones, it's always mm. really popular with our listeners. And um, 
we kind of get a really positive response, a lot of questions out of it. So I think, you know, it's still still quite a mystery for a lot of people. I think in recent years, there's also been massive exposure around the menopause, lots of books, TV programs. People are kind of aware of estrogen and progesterone and their role, maybe. But I know we're going to dive into what else is going on. But before we get into that, tell us a bit about your background. How do you start become a nutritionist and then get into the into hormone health and become an author writing about hormones? Well, like a lot of women, I sort of started late in life. This is a, definitely a second career because I used to work in corporate for many, many years. Um, and then I was uh, I had a really responsible job, big team, the usual stresses and the usual juggles because I had two young children, like six and eight, something like that in my early 40s. And um, I just suddenly and very and gradually started feeling absolutely terrible. I was exhausted. I was just stressed all the time. I had no energy. I um, I had brain fog that was just interrupting my work, really like causing me to worry about, you know, what, what I was doing at work, forgetting people's names and, and forgetting what I had to do in meetings and not turning up and things like that. It was just really scary stuff. Um, and I was putting on weight and my mood was just shocking. And I just I just felt like every day was a battle. It was just survival. And I was walking through treacle just to get to the end of the day. And, you know, it wasn't fun at all. Uh, and I wasn't I was really aware in the, in the background that I wasn't really enjoying my kids. Um, I wasn't enjoying life pretty much at, at all. And I just I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was just the stresses of the juggle and and everything that was happening. But I kind of knew something was wasn't quite right inside. So I did go to the doctor and I sat and poured out my symptoms in my eight minute in my eight minute appointment. And the doctor just looked at me and said, and gave me a prescription and on it, it said Prozac and it was the antidepressant of the day. And I knew what it was, but I was really shocked. And I said, hang on. No, no, I'm not. it's not depression. And he just looked at me and said, well, whatever it is, this is going to help. And he kind of ushered me out. Now I kind of was more shocked than anything. So I thought, hang on a minute, there's something going on with me, but I know it's not that because I've never been depressed before. It's not in my family. It's not something that I'm, that I that I'm sort of vulnerable to and I just didn't think it had happened you know overnight so luckily for me uh, I have uh, my dad is a hormone doctor so at the time I didn't know what that was so <laughs> he um, has been working with women for many many years and obviously it's not something we talk about in our free time and it hadn't bothered me up until that point so I called him up and I said dad I know you kind of do this stuff I think it's I think it might be hormones but I don't know because uh, I don't really know what they are uh, but my doctor wants to put me on this pills. And he said, no, no, Nick, it'll be your perimenopause. And I said, my, my peri what? And well, did you just say menopause? Because that happens when you're old. I was 42 at the time. I'm thinking, no, no, that happens when you're old and grey. And um, I had no idea what peri was. The, this was 15 years ago. So the word it wasn't bandied around there. No one had heard of it. I hadn't heard of it. And I and he explained it to me. He basically gave me the education on my hormones and what was happening to my body that I should have had at school, that I should have had growing up or from somebody. Um, and it it hadn't happened. So as, as soon as he told me the, the changes that were happening and what hormones did, I was like, wow, blown away. My mind was blown because I just thought this is so interesting. And yet none of I don't know about it. None of my friends know about it. Women are walking around completely unaware of the changes that are happening because actually perimenopause starts in your kind of mid 30s uh, and you might not feel any symptoms. But that's the journey. It's you know, that's when it sort of starts to, to gradually um, happen. And I was seven years into that. So, of course, my hormones are changing and, and things are happening. But because I was having a, a regular-ish cycle, it just didn't compute at all. And I didn't link the two together. So my dad told me, kind of, he asked me, are you looking after your hormones? And I said, uh, what does that mean? And uh, what do I need to do? And when he told me what I needed to do, of course, I wasn't. I was kind of doing all the wrong things. But I made some changes and they weren't radical. They were just changes that started to nourish my hormones diet, lifestyle and supplements. Those are the three things that I focused on. And literally within about three weeks, the brain fog lifted, my energy came back, my mood started to balance. And I even started to lose a bit of the weight that I'd put on that I literally couldn't shift. And I thought, wow, this is powerful stuff. And I got really excited about it, really fascinated, but also kind of angry too, because I was really annoyed that we didn't have these tools available to us. And I was so lucky to have my dad in my life, but what was everyone else going to do? 
So uh, as I got more into it, I started geeking out a little bit on the science. Um, I suddenly realized that this is what I'm meant to be doing for the rest of my life to really communicate this work and 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 help other women who were going through it who didn't happen to have a, happen to have a, a doctor that could help them. So um, I went. I gave up my very lucrative corporate job, took a leap of faith, and went back to uh, college and studied nutrition and hormones for the next four years. And that was back in 2014. And for the last 10 years, I've been running Happy Hormones for Life, where we have a team of nutritionists helping uh, women to test their hormones, um, helping them, supporting them through any imbalances and really getting them out the other side. Uh, and, and for me, it's all about that educational piece and giving women the information that they need. They don't need to know all the science, but they do need to know the main changes that are happening so that they can get take power back, take control back and and really um, create the best protocols for them. Because it's not about you must do this or you must do that. There's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. We all have pieces that we need to put together. You guys, you know how important exercise is, how important stress management is and sleep. Uh, and, you know, the dietary piece is also massively important, but it's not the only thing. So we have to put all these pieces together and everyone's jigsaw puzzle is going to look different because we're all unique with different backgrounds and different biochemistries and genes. So it, it's about finding your jigsaw puzzle and, and, and the right protocols for you. And it does take a little bit of experimenting, but we're there to to support women through that process. And hopefully. I love the fact that your dad <laughs> was doing this. Yeah, how amazing. That's so funny that your dad was doing this all that time and you were like, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't bother me right now. I don't need to know about it. Um, and then actually, yeah, I haven't got a clue. And then he was like, oh, darling, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is what I do for a job. This is yeah. what's going on. You're like, oh, okay. Let me tell you um, what it's about. And the interesting thing is that he, uh, at the time, was a massive proponent of bioidentical hormone replacements. Okay. I know we're going to speak about today, but back in the day, um, the, uh, the NHS didn't do any kind of safe body identical HRT. The only uh, the HRT you could get was synthetic, which is the one that it, you know was te- was uh, researched and found that it increased things like risk of breast cancer and and clots. Um, and he was. Uh, providing an alternative to his patients uh, wow. in terms of bioidentical only available then on the private market but it enabled women who could invest to get properly um formulated you know creams and um and proper safe um HRT so I wonder how wow. he feels about you doing this now oh he's chuffed a bit actually he's really chuffed a bit because actually I come from a very long line of doctors and nurses in my family they go right. back generations so and I'm the first one of three. And um, when it came to going to going off to well, picking my A-levels, the last thing I wanted to do was sciences and, and medicine. So I kind of was a bit of a rebel and went for the arts and languages instead. And, you know, he was fine with it. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's a, life has a funny way of bringing you back round. Totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, uh, he must have thought, there she is. She's come back round. <laughs> Finally. Um, yeah, <laughs> Nikki, we, we touched on HRT there, and I know obviously, like, like we know that lifestyle adjustments are, are really, really important. Like, you know, HRT isn't a magic pill in itself. But what, what are your thoughts on HRT? You know, I I love HRT in the right format and for the right woman. And if it's right for you, then it, it's it's absolutely brilliant, and it changes lives. But you know. Um, it has to be the right format. So it has to be the body identical for me because, you know, bioidentical was the old name for the private market of body, you know, for the celebrities who used to go to the posh clinics in Harley Street. They used to buy very expensive creams and that would be bioidentical hormones prescribed individually and all of that. And that market is still thriving. But it, but the NHS has um, finally acknowledged that there is a safe version and pharmaceuticals have actually created safe body identical, they called because they want to distinguish themselves between the regulated body identicals and the unregulated bio identical. Right. So the body identicals on the NHS are things like transdermal estrogen. So that's the the gel, the spray and the patch. Mm-hmm. Um, and then body identical progesterone is comes in a capsule and it's, there's only one. It's called Micronized Progesterone and there's a brand called Eutrogestan. And you take that at night, it's a little capsule and that is natural progesterone that replaces your own progesterone. And the brilliant thing about these hormones in body identical format is exactly that. They are 
molecularly identical to the hormones that you would produce in the body. So there's no synthetic element to it, even though they're produced in the lab, they're made from plants and they're produced to be exactly identical to your own hormones. So when you when you apply them transdermally, the estrogen particularly, the, but it goes into your bloodstream and the body thinks that you've just naturally produced some estrogen. So it knows what to do with that and the estrogen will go and do its brilliant job. Whereas synthetic estrogen used to be, you know, you take it in capsules or tablets and then it has to be um, metabolized by the liver and the gut. And that's where you can get risk of clotting and things like that because that releases clotting factors and things like that. So, so there's a big difference between the two. So if you're on the body identical HRT, for me personally, uh, it's a little bit, I see it a little bit uh, like a supplement in a way because vitamin D is a hormone. Mm -hmm. so take vitamin D willy nilly. So um, we're taking hormones already. And if you've got an underactive thyroid, you will take thyroxin, which is a natural hormone as well. So um, HRT to me, just like uh, if you're taking the right right kind, it's a little bit like another supplement. Having said that, it's really, really important to get the right dose because you don't yes. want to overdo it and, you know, you don't want to underdo it either. So it takes a little bit of experimenting and finding the right dose. But the reason um, I found out so much about it was because in my 40s, um, I used diet and lifestyle and supplements and they were enough for me to manage perimenopause. It, it, it felt like a kind of, you know, I'd found the right toolkit for me to manage my 40s and running up to the menopause. Now, at 51 everything changed. I started getting massive night sweats that were so debilitating, uh, waking up probably half an hour in a complete drench. Um, and that, and you know, my sleep is so, so important to me. I, I'm a complete wreck if I don't sleep a good eight hours of good quality sleep a night. So when I was having these night sweats, I was a mess. I was just cranky and I was gone back to ha worse than how I was before. Uh, because of these night sweats and I tried all the herbal remedies that I often talk about and nothing was really working so um, I, I also was very aware of my mum she'd been diagnosed with osteoporosis about 10 years earlier because she had been taken off her HRT in her early 40s and not been and she'd had a hysterectomy so she'd not had any estrogen and she developed osteoporosis so I was very aware of that as well. And then I did my, the test that we do is the Dutch test. It's a urine test over 24 hours. It's really accurate hormone test. And so I did that on myself and my estrogen and progesterone were very low. And I just didn't want to take the risk of getting bone, um, you know, impairing my bone health, my heart health, my brain health, um, but also trying to get rid of these night sweats as well, which were horrible. So I started um, my uh, body identical HRT. And I haven't looked back. For me, it's been that final piece. Uh, it completely stopped my night sweats. It, I'm sleeping so much better and everything has um, improved. So mm. I, I, I just think um, not everybody needs it because you may not develop a symptom. You may be fine with the diet, lifestyle and supplements. And, and, you know, there are lots and lots of women that go through with no problems at all. However, for me, it was that missing piece. Um, so I say to everybody, do your research uh, look at your symptoms, assess them, look at your history and look at what might be the right thing to do for you. And and always just try things if you're unsure and see what happens. Because as soon as I tried it, it was like, wow, OK, this is what I've been missing. Mm. Um, and of course, I had my dad to advise me as well. So that was that was just lucky. <laughs> um, Nikki, how often do you find people getting the kind of dosage right straight away? I mean, I'm asking for my my own here because I'm about to turn 45 and I've definitely had perimenopausal symptoms since um 42 <clears throat> and I feel like I have managed it um uh, with diet supplemented like cutting out the alcohol um supplements all, all of that kind of stuff yeah. um but I think also there is there has been another shift in me even over the last I'd say like six months so actually one of the questions I was thinking like how how frequently does that dosage is that dosage got right by the NHS I know that's a really kind of sweeping statement but I think one of the things that I would be concerned about is going on to higher dosage or to lower dosage and having to keep going backwards and forwards backwards and forwards mm -hmm. to the NHS yeah a really good question and a lot of women struggle to get the right thing because right. 
I, I also thinking, oh, H, there's HRT. It's a miracle cure, mm. magic pill. I'll just take that and everything will be fine. We the find that of women <laughs> who'd start taking it and go, hang on. I don't feel any better. Yeah. <laughs> don't feel better. Or uh, I feel worse, actually. Yes. And a lot of that is down to, are they on the right format? Are they on the body identicals? And maybe if you're on a patch, you might need to go to the gel or the spray. Yeah. So yeah. that that can be experimented with. Uh, the dose is experimental as well, so that you can start low dose and then build up. Um, they often say to you, you know, start with one pump of gel and then start to build it up gradually and see how you feel. And then you've got to work out what you feel best on. Right. Because there's no exact science, unfortunately. We can test, which is very helpful, um, to see, A, initially, whether you need a certain hormone and right. how low you are. Um, and also, after you're on the HRT, we can test to make sure you're not overloading with a certain hormone so that you're right. nicely balanced and it's getting through. So that's really helpful. But otherwise, if you can't invest in, in that kind of test because that's not available on the NHS, then it is down to you monitoring your symptoms. and you know, keeping a diary, looking at um, different patterns, you know, monitoring your symptoms when, once you're, once you've changed something is really helpful as well. Yeah. Um, and it is just that, unfortunately. So um, it's just a big experiment. <laughs> it's a big experiment. Right. But it's really interesting what you've just said about, because I, I do, we do see that kind of just out, I suppose, I, I suppose on the, on the online space and just people we talk to mm -hmm. that whole kind of like, oh, it's going to be a magic pill, but they're still drinking a bottle of wine a night. They're not exercising. They're eating loads of sugar and processed food. And you're like, well, and your sleep's still to shit. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, like where's, where, where are you going to realize that those, some of those lifestyle factors? Say, the other really common thing I hear is like, oh yeah, the doctor's put me on HRT, but I'm just not getting any better or, or I feel worse, as you said. And I'm like, well, have you been tested since you went on it? Have you looked at your hormone levels again? Mm -hmm. They're like, no. And I'm like, how do you know your dosage right? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm mm -hmm. like, well, you know, one dose of estrogen for one person, the same for another. Mm -hmm. And they're literally just being given the prescription and, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. The doctors can test it in the blood, estrogen, but um, it's not particularly very accurate because your estrogen goes up and down. Yes, yeah. And um, it's a snapshot really of one one moment in time how much hormone yes. you've got in your blood so that the the tests we do do it over 24 hours which gives us much more accurate picture yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but not everyone can do that so it is a case of monitoring your symptoms and seeing how you feel and, and a friend of mine you know she was on one pump of estrogen not feeling any benefits and she went up to three just to see it for a week and she said oh, i'll change my life so <laughs> you know i it, you, you kind of have to kind of just see what what feels good but I would say as well that that menopause isn't just about HRT and it's not just about estrogen and progesterone. We've got 100 or so other hormones running around the body, all doing their thing. They're all chemical messengers that go to every cell of the body. So they've all got these, their own job. So when one's out of balance, it can knock the others because they're all trying, you know, they're all trying to work in this harmonious orchestra and you've got some dodgy violinist and um, making the yeah. whole thing sound terrific. So it's kind of yeah. uh, really, really important to not just rely on HRT. It's, you, you, that's just two hormones you're look, looking after. Even if you get that right, you're only looking after the two. So we've got we've got a whole lot of other hormones that are really important to look after, as, particularly as we get older and through menopause. And um, and when I started learning about this, I was like, well, hang on a minute, all these hormones, what the hell? But actually, the more research I did, there were four that kept coming up over yeah. and over again yeah. that seemed to be doing 80 percent of the work, if you know what I mean. So um, I concentrated on these four. I called them the feisty four. I was about to say, tell us about the feisty four, because we've seen that obviously on your website. And I love this. Tell us about yeah. the feisty four. Um, they are the four that really work together. And are, they, if any of these, I reckon if you look after these four and they're all in balance, you're going to feel great. It's kind of 80%, like I said, of the work. Now, other hormones do other things, but these four are really, really important. So if we've just focus on these, we're going to be mostly there, you know. So um, they are, uh, we've talked about estrogen. That's the last one. We've got cortisol. We know is a really strong one. The strongest, actually, of all the four. We've got insulin, which is our blood sugar hormone, uh, really important. We've got thyroid, which runs to every single cell and actually can mimic a lot of, of menopause symptoms. So we've got to look out for that one because you may not need HRT, you might need thyroxine. 
Yeah. And then lastly, estrogen and progesterone, which kind of work together. So those are the four. And those are the four that can really determine how well you go through perimenopause, if they're in balance or not. And if one of them's out of balance, the others will surely be out because that they all work together and they rely on each other. So you can you can imagine that crossover diagram where everybody's working together nicely. So if someone's listening to this, they're thinking, maybe, maybe I am out of balance with my feisty four. Like, how would you know? How could you tell? And then also, I know that these days there's a lot of home hormone tests you can do. Yeah. What are your what are your thoughts on that as well? Okay, firstly, um, that I have a quiz that you can do on my website. It's completely free. Just happyhormonesforlife.com slash quiz. Go in there and you'll know if you have a hormone imbalance or not. It goes through the various um, eight or so different kind of main symptom areas. So if you're low or if you're scoring low in any of those areas, then, yeah, you need to look at that. Um, I've also got a sort of another quiz in my book, which is uh, there's a whole chapter on the feisty four going into all the details of each one and how to which what the symptoms are of each. And then you kind of score against those symptoms. So there's two different kind of ways you can you can find out if you if you're if you've likely got an imbalance. Of course, it's not diagnostic, but it will give you an idea of where you kind of need to focus, because, you know, if you're looking at cortisol, for instance, that's our main stress hormone. And when that's out of balance, which I would say 90 percent of us probably haven't got. I don't uh, know what you mean, Nikki. <laughs> a nice balance causes yeah. well. Like, how could we be out of balance with our stress hormones in this no, kind of world? It's, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very unusual. <laughs> so seriously, in ten years of our clinic, I don't think I've found uh, maybe one woman who had a normal stress cortisol. Wow. Pain. I mean. I Varying from, you know, minor fluctuations to flat on the floor. So, you know, there's a lot of variation. But um, cortisol is super important, obviously, because if cortisol is out of balance, which which it mostly is, it's, it means that not the other hormones aren't going to be 100 percent optimal. So um, because cortisol is your kind of alpha male hormone, it, it just runs right over all the others. It takes priority because you're in your if your body's in survival, fight or flight. It, your body's in survival so it's going to divert resources to producing cortisol to keep you alive okay so that's going to take resources away from things like your immune system your digestion your other hormones like reproductive hormones I mean the body does not want to be having sex or making babies when you're you know being attacked by a lion it's just not important so it will prioritize it so there's a lot of things that get pushed aside when cortisol's at its kind of height and 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 we're needing it to stay alive uh you know stay alive um in in stressful situations even though we're not being attacked by lions our fight or flight system is exactly the same today as it used to be so the body sees a traffic jam or a deadline at work or an argument with somebody as the same as same threat to you as being attacked by a tiger it's the same level of threat because you only have one stress system your fight or flight it'll it'll trigger the same system so we have today in modern day we have these micro stressors that happen all day long from the minute you your alarm clock wakes you up to the minute you go to bed or kind of wired um we've got these stresses and it keeps our cortisol really high um until it can't do that anymore and then we can maybe go mid and then we start to go low and then we're really really tired so there's a there's a load of symptoms associated with cortisol imbalance from lack of sleep to feeling wired and overwhelmed to anxiety we know that we know all the sort of general symptoms it's kind of not rocket science but but and also particularly for women that belly fat that they cannot share yes a lot of that is down to cortisol as well because we have a lot of receptors in that area because cortisol wants to put fat around your belly because you know it doesn't know when it's going to need that extra energy to be able to run from the lion so it's it it makes sense biologically but obviously it's not very uh nice to have so cortisol is a big one and then you've got insulin our blood sugar uh, hormone which is produced from the pancreas when you eat carbohydrates or protein um, to come along and take that glucose out of the blood and take it to the cells to use as energy it's a really ancient system and it keeps us alive and fueled the problem with insulin is that uh, too much of it can be inflammatory it can cause you to, to be on a blood sugar roller coaster so for instance if you have cereal for breakfast with a fruit smoothie or a fruit yogurt or toast and marmalade or whatever it is, 
you are going to have a big spike of blood sugar, a whole load of insulin is needed to come and take that out because there's a lot there. And then you have a dip two hours later that we all know is, you know, the hangry dip, the, the foggy uh, mind, the, the crabby nature, all of that. It makes you cranky, foggy, exhausted and in fat storing mode because your body's under constant stress. So once you start with a breakfast like that, then you can be on that roller coaster all day because it's really hard to get off it which is why the first meal of the day is so important, whether you have breakfast or not, whether it's brunch or lunch, just making sure that it's really nicely balanced so that you're not, you're balancing that blood sugar throughout the rest of the day. Because also imbalanced blood sugar goes on through the night too. So that can wake you up at three in the morning, which is a lot of people suffer from, not realizing that it may be low blood sugar that's waking you up. So getting off that roller coaster is really, really important because some of those symptoms, and you'll start to see as I go through the four, are sort of starting to cross over. They're quite similar, some of them. So, uh, you know, brain fog can be caused by cortisol, insulin, thyroid, or estrogen, progesterone. So we want to know, to, by doing a sort of deep dive on each of them, you can kind of work out well, what it, it's most likely coming from, but it's not always to do with menopause. So yeah, the thyroid thing really interests me, actually. Can you talk to us a little bit more about thyroid? Yes. Thyroid is one of my favourite hormones. <laughs> I struggle with it a bit myself. Um, I've got a borderline, which is a lot of women is like they have a borderline thyroid, which generally means that your doctor's tested you and you've come out sort of in the very low ends, but not low enough to get treatment. So if you think about the range is 95 percent of the population. So when you sit at the bottom, maybe you're in the 10, 20, even 30 percent of the bottom, you're going to be fairly low because it's such a massive reference range. Okay, so. Oh, we want you to be, we work in the optimal sphere. So we want you, your thyroid to be optimal because that means you're going to have enough energy to get to all your cells. Thyroid hormones supply energy to every single cell in the body. So it's so, they're so important because if you don't have enough thyroid, bits of you, are, depending on what you're vulnerable to, are going to feel knackered and exhausted. So for instance, it, uh, your brain's not going to get enough energy. So brain fog, anxiety, depression, mood swings. Uh, that is going to be the result of not enough, one of the results of not enough thyroid getting to your brain. Hair loss, your hair's going to come out, your hair follicles aren't getting enough energy, dry skin, itchiness, terrible nails, because you're, you're just not getting enough energy, constipation, because your bowels aren't getting enough energy, joint pain. The, I mean, the list goes on. Thyroid, you can pick any part of your body to be a symptom of low thyroid, right? So it affects every cell. So when doctors test you, they test something called TSH. It's quite complicated. I go into it more um, in the book and on my website. But TSH is just your pre-hormone marker. It's your thyroid stimulating hormone released from the brain to tell your thyroid to produce the hormones. Now, if that is high, according to the, the NHS, um, then uh, you are borderline or subthyroid, you know, hypothyroid, basically low thyroid. And then they may put you on treatment, which is thyroxine, mm -hmm. uh, if you're high enough, right? Like I said, the reference range is huge, but also the, the level of TSH, the, the limit, what's the word? The top marker of TSH is very high as well. So you, you've got to be really, really, really bad to be put, to be put on medication. Yeah. Yeah. The rest of us are sitting at suboptimal or subclinical, they call it sometimes, or borderline. Um, and it's not treated because they don't believe it's bad enough. But I can tell you, you're going to feel really, really shit if you're borderline thyroid or you're suboptimal. If, if you you're not going to feel good in any sense. Right. If you can't get that off the NHS, can you? where else can you go to help with your thyroid? Well, no, there's, I mean, I would definitely try and uh, look after your thyroid naturally. That's the first place to start. There are, your thyroid needs so many different nutrients. It needs you to be not stressed. It needs you to sleep well. I need you to exercise. All of that stuff needs to happen before you decide whether you're really going to go on. Because once you're on medication, it's pretty hard to come off medication. You're pretty much on yeah. it for life. So you want to do everything you possibly can to support your thyroid, especially if you're borderline or suboptimal, because you can make huge improvements just giving it the nutrients it needs um, and doing all those other things, diet and lifestyle, before you even consider medication. Mm. I want to ask your opinion on something actually while we've been talking something sent me there you talk about um insulin we've talked about you know how important lifestyle adjustments are but obviously the big thing at the moment is semaglutide drugs 
Like you're <laughs> in pick. Goes, gang. No, you're a in pick and you're wee gubby. Like <laughs> I, I'm anecdotally hearing more and more people say, "Can I had a friend the other day who's just like, oh, yeah, you know, I just want to lose a stone, so I'm, I'm going on it." I'm like, but you know what you should be doing is like, yeah, but this is just easy, right? So we, we know do a those, whole podcast on this. Those drugs work by um, essentially lowering, lowering the insulin that goes into your body. But what are, you, what are your thoughts on people using that when they're not diabetic, but they're just using it for weight loss? Oh, you're really well, putting you on the spot there. I think you're going to know what my answer yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Same as ours, right? You know, I mean, there are no cheats in this life. There mm. aren't. You've got to do the work. Um, Hurrah! You know, if they come up <laughs> with a cheat that is, you know, side effect free, non-toxic, um, doesn't have any other impact on the body. Exactly. You know, Personally, I'd be bloody amazed because that's gonna uh, that's probably going to be natural and not not monetizable. Yes, uh, because it's not going to be synthetic, so they can't monetize it. So it's probably never going to happen. And B, it would be an absolute miracle. So I'm not going to take something that that hasn't been around for long. I won't even even do Botox or fillers, me, just because I just don't know that I'm not judging anyone who does. I'm just just for me personally, Mm -hmm. I just don't know the long term effects yet of those things. I won't even tattoo my eyebrows because I just don't know what that what that's going to do uh, eventually. So I'm not, you know, saying they're not safe. None of that is not safe. I'm just saying I would rather just kind of wait and see what the outcome is, and if it proves to be great and fine, and everyone's happy, and then I'll then I'll have a think about that. <laughs> mm, amazing. Well, it's really interesting because I think from personally, what concerns me a lot as well is. You know, it's two years, isn't it? The NHS are allowing people to to have well, the average length of time. Where, so the NHS is allowing people to be on it for two years. Two years but apparently, the average length of time for private prescriptions is also around two years because then people find the side effects too uncomfortable to carry on mm. living with. Um, but all the studies show that after two years, people regain the regain the weight straight away because, of course, yeah. they haven't done any work on their yeah. emotional triggers for eating, their habits, because it's easy yeah. not to eat. Um, so as soon as they come off it, that barrier is gone, and they just go back. To to where they were for all worse but i would think yeah. um there's some evidence suggesting it's actually catabolic as well so if you've lost muscle yes. mass obviously your metabolic rate will have dropped as well yeah. so you probably put on more weight than you were carrying before but i also think you know like, that happens with diets yeah. don't we that yes calorie exactly. deficit diets if you def- deprive yourself of calories and the body slows down your metabolic, metabolic yeah. rate goes down and, and you end up worse off when you stop doing it so no, exactly it's exactly just another fad diet to me but it's yeah. worse because it's it's something you're injecting yeah. well, and, and we don't know what happens to it um, no follow, I, I, follow the money is where you know it's all oh. about it's follow the money but also I think one of the quite scary things for me being kind of like borderline anorexic when I was younger is what's happening now apparently is um people that are suffering from anorexia are getting hold of it <clears throat> and then they're taking it because it's a way of suppressing their appetite which is obviously what they want so they can I mean that for me is a flip side that not many people might be thinking about or talking no. about, but it's yeah, so many worrying things on that, on that. Yeah, on definitely. That. But Nikki, this has been so fascinating, so interesting. Uh, I'm sure you'll have opened the ears of yes. people into what they should be looking out for, and they'll be scurrying away to take your test or get their hormones tested. All that information's on your website, right? Yeah, we'll yes. put it in the show notes. Great. Um, if people want to reach out to you, how can they best contact you? Just go straight to the website, happyhormonesforlifeforlife.com. Um, there's a contact page on there. There's um, over 100 blogs, so you can just search in the bar for anything you're looking for, and hopefully there's a blog on it. Um, there's a podcast link to, so just go along and have a browse. There's tons of free resources. I've got a guide, quiz, masterclass on there. So the masterclass actually goes through each of the hormones, and you can kind you can follow it in a workbook too, so you can amazing. That would be great for somebody who wants to be sort of guided through it rather than read yeah. something. And you've got your book as well. Yes. You yes. Have your book is here. Oh, let me just right. show oh, Yeah. Great. So I'll put a link right. to the book as well. But it, honestly, from from my perspective as well, kind of starting to feel my some symptoms changing again. You know, I had those a few years ago. Now that it's changing again. I will probably be in touch with you for some tests. <laughs> Or James will. Yeah. He'll be like, do it. Do it, Claire. <laughs> we also test men, by the way. Oh, ah, ah. <laughs> You can come um, for a double package. Yeah, yeah exactly. Fantastic. Exactly. So honestly, Nikki, really, really informative, really fascinating. Thank you. It's been really wonderful to have you on. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.
Yeah. You've been listening to the Midlife Mentors with Claire and James Davis. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. So drop us a line at info at themidlifementors.com with any questions or topic suggestions. And make sure you join us on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. You can find us under The Midlife Mentors. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and don't forget to take the Midlife Reset Audit now to receive personalised insights into what's holding you back from living your healthiest, happiest midlife. So go ahead and take the audit now at themidlifementors.com forward slash audit.